Church of Northridge. Would you please stand and join us if you're able? As we come together now. Let's sing together. Come just as you are. Come just as you Good morning, church. It's good to be back. You know, I I say you're welcome to all of you every Sunday morning. Um, Often I can't get that you're welcome sound from uh, Disney's Moana out of my head when I say it. But this week, uh, Tim and I chose a song that we'll sing in a bit called When Like a Woman at the Well, and it It's tied into the scripture, you'll see, as one of these hymns just was. Um, And because we didn't know the hymn, uh, Tim found uh, another church singing it on YouTube, a circular congregational church in South Carolina. A few things about that were interesting to me. One, it's a theologically progressive church like we are although it's a bit older. 
it was uh, founded in 1681. <laughs> it's like over 300 years. Uh, what was here in California over 300 years ago? I mean, I know a lot of people were, but uh, <laughs> something that was also interesting to me is that it also has a similar byline. Welcome. No matter where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. As I listened, it helped me realize how many people do not feel welcome in a church because of their land of origin, their culture, their race, even who they love. They have been shunned or, or even asked to leave. Our welcome is not just a, a pat phrase. It carries a deep commitment, a commitment to be open and share our love with one another and with all who enter here. A commitment to welcome all into the beloved family of God. You are welcome here, and I invite you to worship with us, either online or here among us in the sanctuary. No matter where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And you're invited to come and, and be a part of this community with us as we learn together about being the beloved family of God. Let's worship together.
join me in the responsive reading. From the wandering of our lives, we have come together here. We bring life with us. Come here, offering your lives before God, and the presence of God will go with us and remain with us in our play and work, in our resting and our service. Now please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the kingdom and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture is from John 4, 5 through 24. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, (laughs) and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true, the woman said to him, sir, I see you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. May God add his blessing to this word. search committee um, review and update, so um, please be prepared to stay after service um, and learn where we are. Um, Our quarters group will be March 21st at 7 p.m. at the Hedge Home, and women are welcome, and we have lots of fun, and we make stuff sometimes. Um, And don't forget that um, there will be candy for sale um, my, March 19th as well, so you can grab some candy and eat it during the um, search committee update. 
And, you know, we always do this as a fundraiser, and this, this year the money is going to go to help with our equipment. Um, and so don't wear your candy until we have ours available to you. And um, I didn't want to forget that there is a council team leaders meeting on Monday on Zoom. Thank you. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You are living home. Your presence. I've tasted and seen the sweetest of loves. When my heart becomes free and my shame is undone, your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the air.
Would you pray with me a moment? Help us, God, to be open to your presence. Now, as we reflect on these words of scripture, and later, as we leave this community and go back to the communities where we live, and may your presence with us always give us the love and compassion, the courage to live lives of justice. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. As I begin to share my reflections on this passage, I need to start by setting in your minds just what a startling example of Jesus' inclusivity, this was. In a time when any respectable sage was, was not even to converse with women outside of his family, and when women were viewed as both dangerous and inferior, the practice of Jesus was radical. Radical inclusivity. Like most stories in John's Gospel, this is rich in symbolism, misconnections, and and double meanings. We saw that last week in the story of Nicodemus in the previous chapter of John. And John uses similar techniques in this chapter as well. Because John is more symbolic than historical, it's likely this story does not go back to Jesus, though it most likely reflects the voice of the early Christian community. The story captures much of what is central to Jesus' message and to the New Testament as a whole. Again and again, the person before Jesus is confused and and asks questions that, that Jesus answers. How is it that that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a Samaritan woman. Historically, there had been a division between Jews and Samaritans over past political alliances and religious practices going back multiple generations. Everybody knew that. This question, though, allows John to have Jesus respond. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. This is almost a teaser to set up the next question. The woman asked, where do you get this living water? Jesus said to her, everyone, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. The woman asked, are you greater than than Jacob, who gave us this well? Now, I I should probably back up a little bit, and some of you may know this, but but that that living water was water that had a a spring that that brought fresh water into it, rather than some collection of rainwater or something like that that people might also need to drink if they needed water. And Jesus didn't have any bucket, as it says there. I love bucket. It's my favorite word. It drives my wife crazy every time I, anything is a bucket. And, but, and there it is. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but, you know, Jesus didn't have a rope to lay down. Didn't, and, and the people who lived there had those things because they knew how to get to that deep water. So the woman asked, are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who, who gave us this well? And and Jesus responds, those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water, gushing to eternal life. And the woman responds, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but, but you, a Jew, 
say the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. The gospel writer here is speaking not only about the Samaritan religious practices, but also about the Jewish religious practices. The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks just as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Later in this passage, John writes, Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. She said, he told me everything I had ever done. It's interesting. We get caught up in that part of the story. I heard some giggles when he said, well, you were married five times. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, how did he know that? You know, this, he must have some special powers. To, that's not the essence of the story, really. But it, it does capture the woman's interest, and it captures ours, and it pulls us in. John is a good storyteller. He knows how to... How to gather and, and work on, on what will attract us until we're able to listen to the truth in the story. Radical inclusivity. There's a lot going on in the story, and, and we can see that I've just touched on a little bit of it. This is not unusual about sacred text. Recently, I was listening to a podcast uh, between Brian McLaren and Barbara Brown Taylor. Barbara Brown Taylor is an Episcopal priest, and, and Brian McLaren is a, a Protestant minister. Um, but both have been academics and, and pastors, and now both are authors and, and speakers. And they were having a conversation together. The podcast, if you're interested, was, is called Learning How to See. McLaren told a story uh, about taking a bus trip with a rabbi. At one point, the rabbi turned to him and, and she said, I just don't get it about you Christians. You seem to look for the single meaning in, in a scripture passage. She said, in our tradition, we find value in, in revisiting passages to find new meaning. As I listened to this, I thought about the passage we read a few weeks ago about Jesus in the wilderness. Whenever I read that passage, I always seem to come back to focusing on the three temptations of Jesus. Knowing that God is, it's by God's grace that we live. The second, that it's not up to us to try to manipulate God. And the third, refusing to be distracted away from loving God. And Jesus, of course, refuses to take the bait in the story. And that's what I always walk away from this passage thinking about. Yet after hearing this podcast discussion, my mind wandered back to that scripture. And, and what I thought about was Jesus in the wilderness, alone for 40 days. After having that, that powerful baptismal experience, he goes away from others for five weeks. I can't help but think that during that time, he was reflecting on his life experience thus far, trying, trying to make sense of it, opening his heart to God and finding his voice. That's what I realized caught my attention. After being raised in his faith community, then committing his life more, more deeply through his baptism, he goes off on a retreat to contemplate what this all means. What we see in that familiar Bible passage about the temptations, in a way, is the result of his inner work and contemplation. Jesus has come to some clarity and found his voice. In our story today, John has Jesus inviting the woman by the well and later others in her community, to look past their differences, acknowledging along the way that some traditions of the Jews could use some airing out as well. 
It's not unusual for spiritual communities to, to need to take a step back and reevaluate things occasionally. In the book study group, we're reading The God We Never Knew. And at the meeting on Thursday, we were talking about life cycles of churches. I was sharing that back in the 80s, those involved in, in church growth saw that there are stages churches go through, and we began to talk about that life cycle of a church. The stages I'm most familiar with are, are birth, which is the visioning and the missioning and the, the, the founding of the church. And then, and then growth, which is uh, the new and meaningful programming and, and mission activities and focus on, on building relationships. And that's the upside of the curve. And then there's a, a plateau time when there's a kind of decision that we're doing okay. We, we've you know, we've got it down. We've, we've got our system together. It's almost like a, a, a bureaucratic process, a, a stabilization. Everything is running, the programs. We can kind of almost sit back and, and relax a little bit. But then things kind of lose energy. Things are the same. And, and we see membership drop off, and, and we see people less involved, and, and then the decline starts. And the church begins to find itself going through the motions, and there's less enthusiasm, even though everyone is busy, but the spirit doesn't seem to be as strong. And then, eventually, death. Now, none of us want to think about our church dying. So the strategy is to stay out of the downside of the curve and stay up in the front side. That is the, the visioning and mission and relationship side of it. However, that means revisioning and changing, letting go and developing new relationships. The early church was not immune to, immune to uh, these stages, nor was the Jerusalem temple or the Samaritan temple. Jesus could see the plateau and death stages creeping up on the Jews. Their priorities were, were more towards keeping things going and making more money. His voice of renewal, revisioning, Inviting others into new relationships with God. For some, it seemed, I'm sure, like the God they never knew. In John's Gospel, we hear symbolism that, that wets our imagination, opens our minds. We, we shake out the cobwebs, causing us to ponder, what does this mean? What does it mean for the woman in the story? What does it mean in our lives? You can, you can feel the draw, the, the hooks Jesus is putting out to this woman. I read a story a while back about a, a young family with a single child. And then the mother became pregnant and, and they were all very excited. By the time the baby boy was born, his sister had, had passed her third birthday. And after the baby was home for a few days, the three-year-old girl began asking her parents that, that she be allowed to go and be in her brother's room by herself. This was kind of a confusing request by the child to the parents, and they didn't know what to make of it. And, but the child kept asking and really wanting to do this. And so finally they decided, okay, we've got a baby monitor, we'll, we'll be okay. So, so they let her go in and she goes in and she closes the door and they hear her walking across the room to her brother. And she says, tell me about God. I'm forgetting. 
tell me about God. I'm forgetting. The story just grips me. It's so evocative and, and haunting. It suggests that, that we come from God, and when we are very young, we remember. But then, as we grow, learning about this world, we, we begin to forget about where we have come from. We lose our ability to know deeply that life with God's Spirit. The words of life of Jesus seem to call us back into that deep relationship with the Spirit of God. Perhaps that's why Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days. Maybe that's why the Gospels talk about him going off by himself to pray. I wonder what captures your imagination and calls you to seek out that, that living water that sustains us and nourishes our souls. Do you allow yourself to take the time to listen for that voice within? To nourish the spirit within you so that you can find your voice and speak words of compassion to others so you can share acts of love and, and being present with others. Does your voice lead you to acts of charity and justice for others? It seems like that's what it did in the life of Jesus. The woman in the well went and told her friends of the life that she had found. They must have heard it in her voice, the power of God's spirit at work in her, and their, their hearts were awakened, and they recognized God's spirit and remembered. And they too sought out Jesus. I wonder how you share words of life and love with those around you. I wouldn't expect that it would sound like Bible talk, but more language from your heart. Words of caring and concern, words of, of love and action, perhaps even words of outrage, and words of support and encouragement to others. Our hearts long to be at one with God's Spirit. Sometimes, though, we need reminders to, to take time away from our busy lives, even, even for minutes, to listen for that voice, to attune ourselves, to be open to that awareness, however it comes to you, of God's love. We think of Lent as a as a time during the year when we can maybe make a little extra effort, fasting from things sometimes to, to give us more time to spend with God. I pray that your Lent gives you opportunities to deepen your love of God. Blessings to you on your journey with God. Amen. And now we have an opportunity to give God, back to God some of what he has blessed us with. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. May our morning offering be an act of gratitude given from a merciful heart.
Join me in the prayer of dedication. One and eternal God of time and space, we respond to you with joy as we bring our offerings. The opportunity to share is a blessing for which we are very thankful. Your generous provisions for our needs prompts us to be generous in return. Accomplish your purposes, we pray, through these gifts and in our lives. Amen. As we move into our time of prayer, I remind you of the prayer requests that are in the bulletin. And a couple more to add. Ramel asked for healing of his gout, and Zill healing of a, a bad cough. Let's be in prayer together. Wondrous God, we are mindful of sisters and brothers asking for prayer, knowing that you surround them with your love even now. Help us to be mindful of your love at work in their lives and how we can support them. God, we sense your presence when we least expect it. Like the woman at the well, we busy ourselves with our daily tasks, important things that help our families or our customers or others in need. Yet sometimes in our busyness, we lose touch with you, our center. And then, there you are, sitting at our well, looking like that family member or customer or person in need, the one we thought we were saving, saves us. God, Help us to recognize you and those we meet. To open our hearts to your love reaching out to us, calling us deeper into love with you. Help us to make time in our lives to quiet ourselves. To listen for your voice. 
that like the shepherd's sheep, we also will know your voice even more clearly. Trusting your love, even through our sadness and grief, our impatience and anger, even through our fear and unknowing. Help us to know and feel that you are always by our side. In the name of Jesus, our brother, we pray. Amen. I just wanted to um, let you all know, I think you know that, that I'm, uh, I've had COVID and I'm just kind of returning to uh, my, <laughs> my regular routine. Uh, but you might not know that, that Janine also had, has COVID. Uh, we kind of overlapped. And so uh, thanks to many of you, uh, we've been able to continue to get out the bulletins and things like that. Uh, but, but some of the other office routines and things that we do in the office have gotten slowed down a little bit. So um, just I wanted you all to be aware of that, and hopefully in the next week or two we'll be back up to speed. So you might be missing some documents or expecting some kind of return, and, 
and we're off sleeping somewhere trying to recover. So, <laughs> yeah, so keep us in both in your prayers, please. Okay. Are there any other announcements? I also want to say a thank you uh, as well to, uh, to Paul and Daniel for coming in this morning as well and uh, jumping in because we had a few others that were out sick to, today too and Vince coming in and sitting up as well. And thank you all for everything you did this morning. It was nice seeing everybody buzzing about to, uh, to get the service ready and everything. So thank you. I worked a convention this weekend and I did Friday and Saturday speaking and pushing what I was selling basically all day. And so it's a miracle that I got here today and that I have some voice. So uh, <laughs> thank you for bearing with me. Anyone else? Please. Thank you all very much for being here. So Welcome back, Diane. Please. Yes, thank you. That was <laughs> Michael loves to do this, but he loves to prepare, and I kind of threw him something in the middle of the week and said, "Help!" <laughs> so, thank you so much last week, Michael. And you had communion as well, so that was a, <laughs> it's an extra. And I missed it because it wasn't, the computers broke down here somehow, so. Go from this place knowing the love of God and opening your hearts to those you meet and receiving the love of God from them as well as sharing it. Amen. Thank you.